Now, tonight's story jam. Our theme is love trumps hate. So we, yeah, especially the day after Valentine's Day. Um, we have stories of falling in love. We have stories of love winning the day and stories of love conquering the unimaginable. Tonight's first storyteller. Life can change in an instant from the ponderments of existential reckoning to the renaissance, that wonder of rebirth. Scott found himself somewhere in between. Please welcome Scott Sanders with his story, Sanders in the Bardo. It's so nice to be gathered here on just the other side of intimacy. Amen. Leonard Crone said that. You can be in my dream if I can be in your dream. I said that. <laughs> There's a uh, old Seinfeld routine. If you remember when George uh, approaches a very attractive woman in a coffee shop and he says, um, my name is George, I'm bald, I'm unemployed, and I live with my parents, will you go out with me? Now that's not what my story's about, but it's important to remember that because it has something to do with the ending. But uh, lately I've been out of sorts. I am sort of one sandwich short of a picnic, one goose short of a gaggle, one part fruit, one part nut, and one part missing. And as an archetypical, archetypal, New Yorker, I'm already a worried man with a worried mind, and some people say that an optimist is someone who has very little experience. Uh, all my life I've been a literal uh, lightning rod for risk. I was kidnapped two times, once in China, and once in the former Yugoslavia. I was under hotel arrest during a violent coup in West Africa where the State Department and Henry Kissinger had to get involved to get me out. I've been in multiple car accidents. I was never the driver. I fell out of a third story window and uh, I've been struck by lightning. <laughs> now all of these experiences have been uh, chaotic and cataclysmic, but they've somehow enriched my life. And I don't know, good luck, bad luck. I live an adventurous life and I'm still here. Now, let's throw in a dollop of cancer. And what's the opposite of six months of bliss? Oh yeah, six month chemo protocol, bite me in the ass. Now you're gonna think this is a downer depressing story about uh, cancer, but it actually has a carnal rapture, happy ending. Believe me. So uh, on somewhere around August, like when I was diagnosed with cancer, it was somewhere around August 19th, maybe at 4.08 p.m. And at the time I was trying to figure out, you know, when am I gonna retire? Should I retire? What am I gonna do when I retire? Well, I retired on August 20th. And after my surgery on September 12th, uh, I was pretty busy between oncology appointments and lab tests and CAT scans and PET scans and taking four pills every morning and every evening within 30 minutes of eating, otherwise projectile vomit results, <laughs> some medieval side effects, and occasional high drama. I was pretty busy. Now, um, most people, some people have like so, sort of no side effects from the chemo. Other people have some side effects. Apparently, I have all the side effects, <laughs> and it's not because I Googled the side effects. <laughs> But every time I have a new side effect, I, I contact my crack pharmacy oncologist, Brad, and ask him if it's normal. So like blistered feet, it's normal. Gray hands, normal. Uh, fatigue, nausea, normal. Black tongue, normal. I say, wait a second, doc. Black tongues matter. <laughs> anyway, I, uh, on the first week of December, I had a new side effect. I had this deep purple rash on my lower back and butt. So who am I going to call? I call Brad, my crack pharmacy oncologist. Now, I don't know Brad. I never met Brad. But I feel like I have a personal relationship with Brad. Every time I call him, he picks up no more than two rings. 
and I have this fantasy that Brad is hanging out at the Bel Air Hotel in LA, <laughs> sipping a mojito, conversing with Scorsese and Scarlett Johansson, and I also detect the faint metallic smell of cocaine. <laughs> so I call Brad, and he picks up the phone right away, and I explain all the symptoms, and he asks a bunch of questions, and uh, then he puts me on hold for two minutes, and I'm thinking, hmm, maybe he's talking to Nurse Jackie. <laughs> but then Brad gets on the phone, and all of a sudden he has this Morgan Freeman super serious voice, and he says, Scott, I think you have a life-threatening situation. I think you have Steven Johnson syndrome, where your throat can close, and your throat can close very quickly, go to the hospital immediately. I hang up the phone, I allow a minute, because there's a riot going on in my mind, and then I call my friend Mandy, who lives about 10 minutes away, to drive me to the hospital. Mandy tells me she'll get here within eight minutes, and I go to the kitchen drawer, and I get an awl, you know, that long, thin, sharp tool, because I'm imagining that I might have to do a tracheotomy in myself. Mandy gets there within six minutes, and we're racing to the hospital. Now, I live in Montclair, land of title companies and restaurants that close, bad restaurants that close at 9 p.m. <laughs> and we're about 10 minutes from the hospital, and we're racing down Moraga. What by the time we hit Broadway, we're about two minutes from the hospital, and I get a phone call from the chief oncologist at Kaiser, and I kid you not, his name is Dr. Ha. Well, Dr. Ha, who's a very serious man, tells me that Brad, my crack pharmacy oncologist, had misinterpreted the data and made a misdiagnosis, and never mind. I gotta tell you, I think that's the definitive loss of in innocence for the phrase, never mind. <laughs> One second, I feel like a Mr. Blonde in Reservoir Dogs, attempting, thinking about administering a tracheotomy on myself, and then never mind. And somehow or other, my mind went to, you know, the uh, John Cusack movie, High Fidelity, where he lines up the albums with his girlfriends at the time. Well, my never mind albums was the Sex Pistols, Nevermind the Bollocks, and uh, Nirvana's second album, entitled Nevermind, Baby Swimming in a Swimming Pool. So Dr. Ha tells me to go home, take photos of the infected area, and send it to him as soon as possible. So Mandy takes me home, she goes home, and then I have the very challenging task <laughs> of using the iPhone <laughs> and trying to take photos of my lower back and butt. And it turns into a Rube Goldberg design <laughs> where I put mirrors on chairs and mirrors on ladders, put a mirror on the floor, and I just can't pull it off. So I call a very, very good friend of mine that I happen to sleep with. Let's call it Penelope Cruz. <laughs> and I ask her if she'll come over to take photos of the infected area. But first I make her promise that she'll still sleep with me after she sees the sad, sorry state of my adipose expanse. And she <laughs> does. And I send the photos to Dr. Ha, and Dr. Ha says it's like folliculitis, just another immune system deficiency, it'll be fine. So I gotta say, being diagnosed with cancer is a surreal experience. I feel like I've parachuted behind enemy lines, but my surgeon tells me, I'm a lucky man, that we caught the, this thing early, and if you're going to get cancer, colon cancer is a good one to get, and apparently my body does not miss having 10 inches less of my 25 feet of intestines. <laughs> and there's this sort of existential reckoning, and maybe cancer just makes, I mean, we all have an existential re reckoning, and maybe cancer, makes you ponder, you know, that the calendar might be shorter. And the experience has been fascinating and enlightening and life-changing, not so enjoyable. But uh, I've been blessed with lots of uh, generosity and kindness on the part of friends and family and, and strangers. And the thing is, there's that old metaphorical icing on the proverbial cake and I like icing, and I like, uh, no, I like cake, and I like icing even better. 
And if you remember the Seinfeld, uh, George Costanza reference, around the second week of, no, the third week of December, I'm at a cafe and I see this very attractive woman, let's call her Kate Winslet, <laughs> and I approach her and I say, I have cancer. I'm undergoing chemo and I have medieval-like side effects. Do you want to get a beignet? And she says, yes. And it's a moment when the wind blows the leaves off the trees. Whether you have cancer or not, every once in a while, you go around a bend and eternity sparkles before you. The moonlight glows and the sunset turns electric. So I have no doubt that love trumps Trump <laughs> and love trumps cancer. And if you want to seek out bliss, you can go to the Grand Canyon at sundown, or you can fall in love in the arms of a beautiful woman. So anyway, I'm not supposed to be this sentimental New Yorker. So there's a um, John Goodman line from The Big Lebowski, where he basically says, fuck it, dude, let's go bowling. Thank you very much.